Yes, okay. Um, so just now you had an in introduction about the concept of uh, uh, lunar gravitational wave antenna and, and, and some other details. And now I will talk about the payload. So uh, also that was shown on slide. R really one of the seismic stations, really. That is, uh, but not before I, doesn't work. Uh, why not? Okay. Um, so this slide I'm going to skip over mostly because we've talked about this, uh, about the, the liquidity, let's say, <laughs> and uh, well, why, why the concept worked. So just now we had a question about it. So we went into a lot of detail. Um, so I think I will just skip this. Um, so and go and go to here. So here I found this nice uh, kind of image with a moon on it so that uh, I can uh, quickly show what the plan is, even though that was also not new to those of you who have uh, looked at uh, previous talks. So the idea would be to, to put a bunch of sensors uh, on the bottom in this case, uh, near, in the South Pole, in one of the craters, uh, to make their local array size uh, kilometer or something like that. Uh, and where would that be? Of course, we've uh, he heard that to put it in the, in the PSR. So the permanently shadowed region, for example, these craters here, you see uh, uh, an, an, uh, yeah, an image of that, which shows the temperatures where all these purple things are permanently shadowed craters. Uh, and there the temperature, yeah, you can't read the scales, but the, the purple stuff is really uh, 40 Kelvin and, and below. Uh, so we wrote a bunch of papers about that. Uh, uh, most recently, uh, uh, the payload. Yeah, it goes without saying. If you want to join the effort, then uh, send us an email, uh, please. Um, so it's going rather quick. Here's the, here's the cartoon uh, slide, uh, or here's a cartoon explanation, at least, about uh, how this uh, sensitivity uh, uh, came. Uh, yeah, how do you, how do you get to this sensitivity curve? Let's say. So it's the inertial sensor sensitivity that I will talk much more about in the, in, the, in the rest of the talk. You divide out this lunar strain response. So I tried with uh, my mouse to, to draw that up. Uh, that's why it looks so ugly. But you see the bunch of modes. Uh, and of course, they, they become smaller to a certain kind of line or, or yeah, not really a line. But then at some point, because the moon gets more liquid, let's say, to, uh, to this process, then the response dies out. And that's why if you divide that flat line uh, on the left cartoon uh, by that, that uh, decreasing line on the right, then of course you get that rise that you see there on the right. That's how you should view that. So, okay, that's nice. So if we then uh, put in LISA's sensitivity and the Einstein telescope, so uh, LISA is of course the the three satellites in space, two and a half million kilometers apart. And Einstein Telescope is a 10 kilometer triangle uh, that uh, is the European uh, idea for the third uh, generation of gravitational wave detectors. Um, of course, on Earth, it's very difficult to, to get into the desert uh, uh, region because of this micro seismic peak, this oceanic activity. Um, and uh, because you have to make a gigantic, uh, uh, unpractical pendulum structures and, and other things. And in space, with satellites, it's, of course, very difficult to get into the desert region uh, because you have to start making uh, cavities uh, uh, between your, uh, to get enough power to get that shot noise uh, down, let's say. But we will hear more about uh, uh, the SIGO because they're, they're essentially trying that. Uh, what we're trying uh, is now obvious, and, and, and we can make a, a quite a nice uh, uh, yeah, bridge between these two uh, things, as you see here. Uh, and that means things like uh, mul uh, multiband, uh, you know, getting sources that Lisa picks up, then says, oh, you're going to expect, uh, you, uh, tells us, you know, this fictive world in, in 15 years when all of these three are up at the same time, which would be amazing, of course. Uh, you're going to see uh, this, this thing go in, in your band at this date, and then you see it, and then we can tell Einstein Telescope the same, and then we're all happy with, with ourselves. <laughs> that would be, of course, very nice. But in any, way, in any case, let's focus on, uh, on the LGWA and, and the payload. So this has been uh, talked about before. So here you see this uh, nice render that Jan made. Uh, so you see some sort of uh, uh, powering uh, to some sort of cent central lander. Uh, that also has one of these seismic stations and then uh, 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 rolled out in some fashion with drones or, or whatever. Uh, uh, 
are these things. So if we zoom, out, zoom now on these seismic uh, uh, stations or payloads, then, uh, then we get to something like this. Of course, this is not a very practical way, but I, I, I looked at uh, Jan's image and tried to make something that looked a bit like that. I guess it's not the best to make such a vertical thing, but in, in any case. Um, so yeah, like was also on slide, uh, there would be two horizontal ones uh, that are per uh, perpendicular to each other. Uh, there needs to be some kind of cooling. We are now uh, working together with uh, University of Twente to use sorption coolers, which are very low vibration coolers. I have a few slides on those. Um, and, uh, of course, we need some sort of leveling to make sure our uh, uh, very, uh, very softly suspended things don't fall uh, on one side and uh, yeah, don't work anymore. So you have to make sure that uh, these uh, suspensions, uh, which are Watts linkage suspensions, they are made such that they are very low frequency, so mechanically very sensitive, uh, yeah, that they, they remain free so that they can oscillate and pick up uh, the, the vibrations. So first, a quick word about the platform leveling system. So uh, we, we could think, ah, oh, but this, this has been done before. For example, uh, uh, Mars Insight, uh, they have, uh, yeah, things, you know, large range, uh, a kind of double system with two sensors and uh, different actuators where they get to the resolution that we need as well. Uh, we need something like 10, uh, 10 or 20 uh, microradian uh, in order to keep this mass free. But of course, this is not in a cryogenic environment. So we're, we're probably going to need, or surely going to need different, uh, different technology. So, okay, that, that's that. And now I'll take you on a bit of a historic tour, a kind of personal tour on, uh, uh, yeah, the, the making Watts linkages with uh, some sort of sens very sensitive readout. This was uh, part of my PhD. So this was a sensor that was developed during the PhD. Here you see the Watts linkage. So what a Watts linkage is, is a, is a proof mass uh, suspended by a pendulum and an inverted pendulum. So a pendulum, we all know, it's a very stable system. And an inverted pendulum, you also know, because you've played with a broom on a stick when you were a kid. And you know that it's an unstable system because you have to do things like this, right? Yes. So if you now make sure there's just enough mass or just a little bit more mass hanging off the pendulum, then it's supported by the inverted pendulum. Then you can make a system that is just stable. In other words, very soft. So mechanically uh, sensitive, low frequency. So then you have something suspended inside, inside a frame, the frame you put on the thing you want to measure its vibration of. In our case, this would be hopefully rigidly attached to the, you want to be rigidly attached to the lunar surface. And then uh, above the resonance frequency of, the, of, the, uh, of this suspension, this is now an inertially suspended mass. So it will not move along or uh, exactly with the, uh, uh, with the frame. Um, so, so then if you take a differential measurement between the proof mass and the, and the frame with, in this case, an interferometer, then you're in business, then you have a vibration sensor. That's, a, that's the essence. So we had this thing uh, on a suspended uh, uh, bench. So this is an optical bench, uh, but it was suspended here. You see the suspension wire, if you, uh, if you believe me. Uh, and uh, that's how we did uh, measurements, uh, because uh, of course that suspension kills uh, high frequency seismic noise. Um, and so uh, here you see uh, the same thing, but then uh, you can take a bit of better look at the interferometer readout. So here below you have your classic Michelson, and we read out both arms. Uh, so this one is the usual output port, but by this uh, top beam splitter, we can also read out uh, the other arm. And we can then subtract these two signals, subtract out all the common mode noise of the laser, for example, and uh, in that way get very precise uh, uh, signals. Um, the only thing is you need to lock this interferometer if you want to get to femtometers. Uh, so that means uh, this subtraction will degrade if you just let the interferometer roam free. Um, so uh, that's, that's the only part. So you need some sort of uh, uh, feedback loop. So in this case, we fed back to this uh, voice coil, so a coil magnet actuator. Uh, and then the signal that you need to keep the mass in, in, in one place, so now the mass is really secured in the frame again, um, is then your output. That's, uh, that's, that was the working of this, of this sensor. So this is the, the, the main result. Uh, and, and at some point, my, the time of my PhD was over. So uh, this is, uh, I would have loved to continue it because there are some un unresolved things. But... What you see here is uh, you see a bunch of things that are uh, specs. So those are the lines and other lines that look like measurements. Those are two measurements of 
that uh, accelerometer that you just saw, the, the, the watts linkage with the interferometric readout, and the commercial sensor uh, geophone called the Cercel uh, L4C. So both of them measure the same at low frequency because they're on a suspended bench. Uh, you, just see the, you just see the suspension modes, in this case damped, so you just see a bump. This is the last mode of the, of the, of the suspension, after which, because it was a three-stage suspension, you have a one over F to the sixth uh, slope down, which at some point the, the Cercel hits its own noise floor. And uh, if all things had gone well and we would have created uh, exactly the sensor that we wanted, then this blue line would have hit this uh, self noise of, of our, our modeled noise of the sensor, which is typically thermal noise and, and readout noise, in this case, shot noise. But there are some other things that we don't fully understand. Uh, in any case, we reached th uh, eight femtometer from 30 hertz onwards. Um, but yeah, so I, that's why I said uh, I have mixed feelings when I show this result because below this uh, uh, green curve. So this green curve is the, the, best, uh, the best inertial sensor that LIGO uses in its uh, suspensions. So we're better than that. And I think it's also one of the, uh, one of the best, if not the best inertial uh, measurements uh, ever. Uh, but we don't, reach the, we don't reach this. And I don't understand, especially this slope here, one of F to the third. It's probably thermal, but I don't really know yet. Here I have some ideas about that we don't reach the shot noise. Uh, but in any case, we would like for uh, LGWA to, uh, well, reach the shot noise, of course, uh, but we also want to do something about this. But here we uh, are shot noise limited only from 10, 20 hertz onwards. Uh, and you just, uh, Jan just uh, showed that we really want to be below one hertz. So we need to do something about this thermal noise. Well, of course, putting your sensor in five Kelvin or in, yeah, ultimately five Kelvin, that's the goal that helps. But uh, this quality factor, so the, 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 let's say the losses in your system uh, were so high uh, and the quality factor low uh, because of this coil magnet actuator. So we had, a we had a magnet, permanent magnet and moving metals. So that causes any current damping and uh, that gives you uh, that this value is so low. So you need different uh, things. So in any case, a bunch of things needed to change about the sensor design. And so I had to lay a new uh, puzzle. So one thing that uh, is bad here in this one is that here you dump half the light and when the returning this arm that you want to read out also half the light goes back to the laser. So uh, ultimately that turns out that 62.5% uh, 60, uh, of your light you just uh, kind of throw away, which is a bit of a waste and not a very good idea if you want to remain cryogenic and at a certain temperature. So uh, we use polarizing optics. So if you do that, uh, then you can uh, get all your light to your photodiodes. Uh, so you, have, uh, you, you, can, you can have your linearized polarized light through your polarizing beam splitter. And if you do that well, then most, if not all, goes to your Michelson. And the returning one hits this quarter wave plate uh, twice. So also has, so, ha so now if again it hits your polarizing beam splitter, it will actually reflect rather than transmit. So then all the light goes to the photodiodes. You can see that here by the red and, uh, and blue line that are roughly equal of size. There's some absorption still or something like that. Here's that working point that I told you about. Here we want to lock. So you want to be on the linear part of that, of that uh, differential signal uh, and keep it there as much as you can. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we have, we've done this measurement at a kind of uh, 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 tabletop, uh, big, uh, uh, Interferometric readout. Of course, you want to miniaturize it and put it next to, uh, put, put, attach it to your, to your watch linkage, and that's uh, that's the next step. We're working on the CAD designs, and uh, and this will go into production quite soon, for the first uh, version. Then the the getting rid of the magnets. Uh, so this we had the the coil magnet uh, actuator, uh, which is a push pull uh, actuator. So that 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 is the nice thing out of it, uh, because. The thing that I'm now looking into is because we're so cold, you might as well use superconductivity to, to, to have low noise, low power uh, 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 yeah, actuation. And here, what, I, what, uh, what is the plan is to just have, a, is to use the Meissner effect, uh, essentially. So you have a, a coil, a superconducting coil that uh, sends a magnetic field to some superconducting surface. Of course, it cannot enter. Uh, these magnetic lines, so that they have to go around and have some magnetic pressure and you have some force. So this is a push only uh, uh, actuator. So now you need two on each side of your mass or, or, 
or, or at least you need to. Um, something that, we, that we've been doing, uh, I had a postdoc uh, to, working together with a, a Belgian company uh, making essentially these, uh, these superconducting spirals. So these are deposited niobium spirals. Um, and uh, the postdoc, uh, Elvis, he did some, uh, it's all written down here, but he did some uh, analytic, um, uh, analytic uh, uh, work and also some, some FEM work in COMSOL to, to make sure that uh, we, we were doing the right ge geometry. Uh, we couldn't really finish that work because Elvis suddenly got a permanent job in uh, Brazil, so he, he took that. Uh, so uh, this project, uh, yeah, uh, took, took a bit of a hit. Uh, uh, luckily, you'll see more after the coffee uh, uh, today of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, our, our friends here and uh, 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 collaborators that uh, also uh, are in the business of, of, of making these uh, coils. Uh, then another thing uh, that, so when I first thought of this idea, I, I was very naive and my electronics knowledge is not that great. So I thought the least thing I have to worry about is electronics because, you know, uh, in, in, in the cold, uh, that will go very well. Uh, that turns out not to be the case. So I needed uh, collaboration with uh, people in uh, Leuven. Uh, to work in this uh, uh, yeah, nanoscale CMOS uh, uh, technology. So they have, they have lower thermal noise. Well, you can see here uh, all the things that are, that are uh, good and things that you have to worry about and design uh, a bit better. But once you have that all under control, then you can take in the photodiode signals and make some uh, uh, control signals to, for example, the current drivers of, of, of these two coils that you have to, uh, that you have to actuate on. And so uh, this is under development and hopefully we will have it also in, in well, you'll see at some point that the, at the end of this year, we'll have some sort of test with uh, some cryogenic uh, uh, sensor, hopefully with as, as many of these components as, as we can get ready. Uh, but if we all put these, these, let's say, puzzle pieces together, then we get something like this. So again, you see the watts linkage, you see the two actuators, the interferometer greed out the chip, and, and now you see it all connected. So. The chip provides control signals to, to, to uh, as the yeah as the controller did uh, in the other in the other case to 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 make this and this watts linkage is uh, uh, we're now trying to get it into monolithic uh, uh, niobium. There were there were all, the watts linkage that you saw before was also monolithic, but that was in high strength uh, aluminium. Uh, and now we would like to be uh, niobium because then you get the best of both worlds in the sense that you have something that was mechanically very good. And it's very dense as well. So you have a very tiny thing. So all your cryo cooling stuff is uh, lesser volume than if you do it, uh, uh, yeah, for example, in aluminium. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's all, all well and good. Uh, and then let's compare it to, to, to other things you could do. So this dash line is the single magnet actuator. That's the one I, that's uh, one of the, my PhD, let's say. So it has a, also has a different slope because it's uh, viscously damped rather than structurally damped. Uh, you can do something else with uh, also at room temperature uh, with shielding magnets. So th these are two magnets in opposite polarities also running through a coil, but then you're, uh, you generate less eddy current damping. So then, uh, then that sort of works a lot better. Uh, but if you want to get really, uh, yeah, be flat down to one Hertz, then you have to do uh, cryogenic niobium or, uh, cryogenic uh, uh, silicon, as we saw in uh, Jan's presentation. And you see here that uh, the, the, the readout noise is, is, uh, is lower. So all these things combined, the relative intensity noise, frequency noise of the laser and the, and the shot noise, they, they come to this, uh, this dashed uh, black line. Uh, and if we then compare it to the most sensitive stuff that you can buy now or that is being made in our community. Uh, so for example, the AEI watts linkage with LVDT readout or um, uh, yeah, Virgo also has, uh, has, a, has, I think it's also watts linkage. Also with, uh, these are LVDTs, so these are in inductive readouts. So you can get pretty sensitive really to, to, to picometers and such, but we really have to make quite a step. Uh, and uh, although I showed you that uh, I know how to do femtometers, uh, that was really at high frequency. So this is a different, uh, yeah, we have our, I have, and we have uh, our work cut out. But anyway, uh, uh, then something more about interferometric readouts. So this is a paper, uh, uh, very nice about the, the Kramerau lower bound of these different uh, readouts. And so it's a kind of uh, a theoretical uh, a minimum that you, that you could obtain. 
if you if you don't take into account very technical noises. So here it was really about uh, uh, shot noise, thermal noise. No, shot, what was it now? Shot noise, um, electronic noise, and dig digitization noise. So those were the three things. And quite theoretically, you can get to these kinds of uh, uh, different things. So there's deep frequency modulation. Uh, that's uh, mostly handled in the next talk, so I won't uh, 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 talk about that. We have five minutes. Ooh, I should uh, hurry up very rapidly. Anyway, uh, let's go then to conclusion. Uh, the homodyne, uh, if you, so, so the take home of this is, if you uh, have a good actuator, uh, so you're able to lock your interferometer, then homodyne will give you theoretically also the best uh, if you, if you have your operating point, so halfway up the fringe where, where I showed you, uh, we have it. Then you, for 10 uh, milliwatt input power, then, then that's the best you can do. But if you want to do, uh, if you don't want to do that, so leave your mass uh, going around, which is a much simpler system. Uh, so run it in open loop, uh, then uh, uh, yeah, that's much better. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, fly through a bit. So here you see our adventures with, uh, with niobium. Uh, some things are going right, some things are going wrong. We're not there yet, that's the conclusion. Uh, then uh, uh, something uh, that uh, you can also do is uh, uh, instead of using interferometer, use superconducting uh, sensing. So what you could do here is uh, have that, uh, it's also the Meissner effect, but if, you're, if your superconducting surface moves closer to your coil, then that changes the induction, inductance. So if you then put that in a, in a circuit with another coil, then, uh, and, and some sort of current that always runs there, uh, you can uh, you can have uh, you can have some flux falling on a squid, and then you can read out uh, very well the position. So this is what uh, this is what was done uh, here essentially, and uh, yeah, this is here we uh, suggest to do it with the silicon. Uh, with this, uh, yeah, that's that's really future uh, stuff. Silicon watts linkage um, because the usual uh, um, spark erosion techniques that we use to make the monolithic metal ones. They, uh, they, don't, yeah, they, they don't work necessarily for uh, silicon, so we have to do some tricks. Uh, so if you do what I showed before and, and, and what I showed previous slides, then you can get, uh, for example, you can see your thermal noise going down because silicon is, is lower, uh, it, it, higher Q, uh, if you compare from left to right, and uh, uh, interferometric versus squid. Squid, you can uh, yeah, get sub femtometer. That's essentially uh, it. Uh, and then there was uh, uh, the Pathfinder mission, uh, sound check. Uh, so you've seen, we can do uh, a, a simpler interferometer and uh, uh, no controls. Uh, uh, so maybe do something like a homodyne quadrature as, as you saw before. So maybe we can improve this measurement uh, a lot uh, and get closer to this, this, this best estimate kind of uh, that we have. Um, okay, uh, then about the cooling, oh, I think I'm uh, <laughs> taking too much time. Uh, quickly about the cooling. So here's a little cartoon about uh, how sorption cooling uh, works. So you have all these uh, activated carbon. Uh, in that you have these uh, gases. So that's the red here. So you heat it. The gas desorbs. Uh, then uh, that you let that expand through an orifice, and by that expansion uh, you get cooling. And so then uh, that then that gas is sorbed back into your activated carbon, and you can do the thing again. So you only heat and then the rest is all passive valves and, and things like that. So there's no mechanical, like a pulse tube uh, running, something like that. Uh, okay, let's uh, continue here. You see them in action. They've already flown uh, for the Darwin mission, for example. Here you see how that uh, looks like. Um, yeah, we'll probably share the slides so you can look at, look at these numbers a bit. Uh, maybe interesting to note, uh, we need about 10 for, for this setup. You need about 10 square meters of uh, radiator panel because, yeah, you can drop into the 40 Kelvin, but you still have to couple to it. Uh, and uh, we need about six watts of electro electrical power for this, uh, this system. Uh, then there are all kinds of choices that we need to make that I don't think I have time to, to go through. You can see there are lots of things we can do. Uh, different temperatures, different superconductors associated with these different temperatures, different readouts, as I showed you, different watts linkages, and how to power is, of course, still a big problem. Uh, this movie is about, uh, I'm, is about, yeah, I will skip that because there, there's an animation on the other, there's a thing on the other side. So here are the two, sensor, uh, two sensors, also a vertical one with a leaf spring that we're going to test. This is the homodyne interferometer. This is the homodyne quadrature interferometer. 
Um, and here's the, the movie holds this uh, uh, e movie was about e-test. So we have Gemini uh, that that uh, still is under construction. E-test is uh, end of this year. It will be here called uh, a kind of platform that will be 25 Kelvin and seismically isolated. Uh, so uh, because you have an active platform, inverted pendulum, so it's, it's very uh, low noise at low frequency. Uh, and we'll do a test end of this year and then another test end of next year. And then uh, we first are testing components and, uh, and we're doing that as we speak. So we're doing collimator tests. So here you see a collimator shining into another fiber and then going, to, uh, going into something like that. Uh, then there are subtraction techniques between the sensors. Uh, they're being tested at, uh, at Etna because it uh, is very similar to the regolith using uh, uh, data processing algorithms that are, have been developed uh, mostly by uh, Jan and, and others. Uh, to, uh, to subtract this, the Newtonian no noise at the terrestrial detectors. And uh, here is uh, an outlook that I'll just uh, uh, leave up before uh, thanking you for your attention and shamelessly uh, plugging uh, that I'm looking for a postdoc. So uh, if you, uh, <laughs> you uh, want to join, then uh, please talk with me or send me an email, etc. So I'll leave this up and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any quick questions? Uh, we are already... We're running short of time, so one or two quick questions. Sir. The gravity on the moon is much lower, so how do we do the tests on Earth? Uh, it's not a problem. Well, you, to do to do the exact test in that gravity, that is yeah. something tricky, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, well, we've seen that it can go wrong uh, yeah. with, uh, <laughs> yeah. with so, uh, you, the other you one. So, you, yeah, you, mo you have to model it somehow uh, mm -hmm. and, and for the rest, make sure that uh, you, can, uh, ma yeah, you can make what you, you can, you be sure that all your fabrication techniques uh, can, can make that. But to, to be in one sixth uh, gravity, uh, yeah, I don't know if we will actually. I guess you can if do something can with the plane the, or something. If we can lift strange. the inner shell mass. Or you can do something like that. Yeah, but is that exactly the same? I'm not sure. Sorry? No, uh, question, uh, one question, quick question connected. What is the test mass, uh, reference uh, what, mass what? weight here? Well, the, the prototypes I'm building now are one kilogram, but for, uh, for LGWA, we hope to go for 10, 10 kilogram. But scaling mass, would it help? Oh. It can be lifted with some kind of a magnetic force. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we, we already have these tuning coils, uh, hopefully, uh, that are, and then if you just put a DC on both, then that lifts. So yeah. well, that's already did. in place for the, for the ultimate system as well, because that will help me tune uh, the resonance frequency once I'm deployed. Yeah. And maybe yeah. things have changed, yeah. Would that cost? Lifting it, yeah. You would hope then that you you lift it so perfectly vertical that there's no coupling. Uh, that yeah, that you have to take care of pretty well, I guess. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, the magnetic. Uh, no, it shouldn't. Shouldn't. Yeah. Well, you have to take care that those uh, field lines don't. Well, if they're DC and they stay. Nicely DC, and you can always correct for it. But yeah. anyway, thank you for the presentation. So, just a quick question: uh, Has superconductivity or, in particular, Meissner effect been exploited to make more sensitive seismographs on the Earth? Yes. Before. Yes. So, uh, yes. So, uh, I hope that I can do a dual shot <laughs> with this thing. So to uh, to have these uh, sensors uh, also at, at Einstein Telescope to to measure all the way down. So, so Einstein Telescope, you you have all these you have massive suspension to make your mirror very quiet, but then you have to cool your mirror. So maybe you have to put a, a cold finger on it to get some cooling power there, which might introduce vibrations. If you want to monitor that, you, you don't have a sensor that's sensitive enough so far down the chain. Hopefully, this, this can contribute a little. Yeah. 
Can I, uh, I okay. look at the chat? Oh, online. Uh, Sendil. Ah, Sendil, oh, go up. ahead. Uh. Yeah, there's, he just says hand up. Hello, Sendil, can you hear? Unmute me. Maybe that yeah, computer yeah. can do it or not. Or there. Only there. Oh, there? Okay, I'll do it. Probably participants, that's okay. Sindhil, can you hear? You can probably hear, but... You have to unmute him. No, no, no. At the, at the yeah, there. In the other list. Okay, maybe yeah, we can. Uh, no, from there. You... This one, no. You can only ask. Control D. No. Where is it? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we have. Yeah, I can hear you. I can speak now, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, some, uh, I had one question. This choice of niobium for this vital linkage flexure, uh, are you using the superconducting properties or just for the Q, mechanical Q? Oh, so I, I hope to use. Uh, now it doesn't work. So I hope to use the superconductive. So I hope. So if, I, for example, if I use silicon and yeah. I want to, um, yeah, uh, um, yeah, put forces on my on my proof mass, then yeah. I need to add a superconductor to the yeah. silicon. Yeah. Whereas if I have an, uh, whereas if I have a monolithic niobium, then I can make a surface just by design and just have my coils close to that. Uh, which is easier to, to make, I suppose. Yeah, no, no, the reason I ask is that <clears throat> within the LIGO project, um, because of fused silica hydroxy bonding, there's a lot of expertise in uh, low loss bonding. So it may be easier to uh, realize this uh, flexure watt suspension using fused silica as a flexure element. And the yes, Q can be very, very high. This is so, exactly what I want to do for the silicon. So uh, you saw, I didn't have really time to, to, to go into it, but you saw like a, a reddish leg and, and the rest was a, a sort of a dark gray, which is because I want to make the legs out of uh, high quality wafer okay. uh, and etch that and make the rest uh, out of uh, doped uh, silicon that will actually respond to spark erosion. Sure. Uh, the other alternative was to build and it. And then bond those with all the indeed uh, qualities of, uh, of uh, the collaboration. So one of, one of the things that doing with the fuel silica is that we understand fuel silica bonding very well and that responds to laser welding also without the intermediate oxide layer. And then the optics could be part of the suspension itself. It could be just a daltry coating on that and the actuators could also be coating on that. Just a thought. Yeah, no, it's also an option. Yeah. But I, I would hope that uh, we would benefit of the, 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 the R&D R &D now for, for, uh, for bonding, bonding silicon. Sure. And, then we can, and then we can do all of it, what you say as well. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.